have David Bark Hacks. Raise your hand, David. <laughs> we have Leslie Abazian. <laughs> Tina Howe. <laughs> Lauren Gunderson. <laughs> and Sherry Wilner. Um, David, as you know, last night became our winner for our contest and has a production um, about Mothra, which you will see tonight, <laughs> at, in Summer Shorts. So he is a Summer Shorts Festival playwright, as is Leslie Ivazian this year, a Summer Shorts Festival playwright finalist. Um, here we have Sherry Wilner, who was a finalist last year and has a production this year, who is, so we're developing work as we go along here. Um, a festival playwright this year, and Lauren Gunderson, who has the, the family musical this year, which she has also been working on since we are the first production since that play was commissioned at the Kennedy Center. And then we just have our great, wonderful goddess, Miss Howe, <laughs> who will be leading us a little bit later. Um, and, I, and, and so to turn, I guess to start things, um, I would like to go to Tina and ask about um, your experiences. I had put down the Lark Theater, for example, as a place. I know you, you do things all over the place. But if you would like to talk about that or anywhere else, carry on. And she's also at Hunter. She is the head of the MFA program at Hunter for playwriting. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> First of all, in case any of you wondered, Last night I was so excited to see a friend who was a friend of a dear friend of mine that I embraced her so vigorously that she spilled her entire glass of red wine <laughs> all over my trousers. <laughs> and I had one blazingly red trouser <laughs> and one snow white one. And the question was what to do. So being a thrifty New Englander, I went home to my room and got out a little a bar of soap and washed them in the sink. And all of, this, all of the red wine came out of the trouser and out of the sparkly shirt and out of everything. So I just want you to know that if you ever steal wine, <laughs> you don't have to go to the dry cleaner that costs, you know, $800 to get it with soap and water. And to me, there was a, I don't know, there was a, a message in that. It was a metaphor for coming down here to Florida, being all pristine, and then getting dappled. <laughs> you know, getting painted and deciding that the paint was beautiful, but maybe the paint should, should be somewhere else. Um, and I think to answer Susie's question, um, to me, so much of, of being a playwright really involves community. Um, I never went to graduate school, and I never was part of a writing group. I did it all by myself. And I, when I talk with my friends who are going to Yale and talk about their wonderful mentors, you know, these aged men with, you know, one leg and ear and wax <laughs> falling out of their ears and patting them on their head and saying, oh, you're such a wonderful writer, uh, which gave them courage. And I never sort of had that. And not having that, um, I'm very aware of how important it is to have some sort of a community that you can rely on and that, you, that will exalt you and that it will inspire you. And um, so at Hunter, where I'm teaching, I, I make a point of trying to get the students to bond. Because in the long run, I think that their, their affection and um, being at, at stake with, with each other is much more important than what they get from us aged professors. And it's when the, you know, when the dark hours of the night come and when they're, when they're not sure what they're writing and if their writing is any good, they call each other and they go off on retreats to, to each other. So, it's like this, this very conference here that, that we are all now together because in the end, it is a lonely endeavor writing plays because in the end, I think the best plays come from us going deeply into, our, our, into, our, into the mysteries and the terror of our lives. And, and, and people so often say, write about you know, what you know, but I think basically the best plays are writing about what you don't know, and what eludes you and what sort of scares you. And so, um, I know that there, there are people here that are going to talk about writer's group. And my feeling is that if you're not at a university, um, it's, it's, it's really important to have a writer's group or else a wonderful husband who loves your work and will tell you hourly how great it is, <laughs> or, or a wife or a partner or whatever. Uh, 
But I think, I think the hardest thing for us as playwrights is, is to know how to forgive ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you need a community. Um, the situation of the Lark, Arthur Copert, who's um, sort of in charge of the, of the Playwrights Workshop, where uh, every year for, um, for eight months, every, or twice a, every two months, um, they assemble five extraordinary playwrights who bring in work to have it read in front of, 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 of each other and actors and in front of the co-host, who's either me or, um, or David Henry Wang or Doug White or David Oz or somebody. Um, and what I've noticed over the years is that the, the playwrights in the playwriting workshop are getting more and more starry. They tend, they, they tend to come from straight out of Juilliard and Yale. And the, one time when John Iser and I were having lunch, and I was saying, you know, you know, I think you should widen the net. For instance, you, you've never had anybody talk about the one-person show. Maybe get Lisa Crone, somebody like Lisa Crone, a young Lisa Crone, in to the Playwrights work, work, Workshop. So we got Lisa Crone herself <laughs> to come to the workshop. Um, so it's very, it's very exciting because the, the level of the work is very high. But I've noticed through the years, as the Lark is making more and more of a name for itself, that the writers are getting, um, they have more experience, they've been around the block more, their voices are more assured. But for them, when I said, you know, John, this isn't fair to the others, Lisa, to give Lisa this, and, and she, he said, oh, but she's loving it, it's so important for her. She needs a place to, to you know, to hone her work as well. So, um, you know, that's all I have to say about the Lark, is that it is, you know, if you reach a certain level, um, you can get in and you can really fly, and it's really wonderful. But it's this, being in the room like this together, this is everything. This is everything. That's it. <laughs> well said. Who would like to take on from here? I'll tell them about community. Um, because I think there's there's the, kind of the official readings, as Tina was saying, places like the Lark or the O'Neill, or I mean, all, all sorts of um, places that have either those kind of what I think is a bit of the dreaded four hour rehearsal than a public reading kind of model, which is a lot of pressure. And um, because for me, I think the readings are, are always work. Even if you have that four hours, it, it feels very passive to be like, well, I'll have my play read to me and others. But really, you're working the entire time um, because you know the, the plays want to be produced. They want to be up and, and, and alive and in color and um, uh, with all of the other brilliant minds of the theater designers. But, but in that early phase, that's something you can do in your living room, and I often do. I mean, that's the, my community in San Francisco. Um, I, you know, after a couple of years of being there, but in New York and in every community, you know actors. You, you, you are friends with them, I'm sure, and, and directors and designers, people you admire, and you can just feed people free chili and, and good wine, and they will come to your house, and you can do readings, and get, get the first couple drafts of the hearing it out loud, and you learn so much, even if there's no, none of those talk back kind of things. And, and um, clever questions and all this business. Um, it's just about hearing it in, in that first way. So I think a lot of this kind of developing you can just do by yourself. And, and of course, the other, the other um, elements will come after that. And it'll be more likely that you'll say get into the O'Neill or Pacific Playwrights or um, Humana or any of those kind of various levels of production if you play has already had some pre 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 production. Pre film. David? Um, I'm sort of based at. Um, in terms of the community, and I think like everything that Martina said, I think it's uh, exactly true of um, the Labyrinth Theater Company in New York, which is kind of a collective of um, writers and directors and actors. It's predominantly an acting company where a lot of actors were then encouraged to write. And uh, some of the writers that have come out of there, Stephen Gerges and um, John Patrick Shanley, who didn't come out of there, but he was kind of developed a lot of stuff there. And, a lot of the dynamic there that has worked for me in, in the sense of the community is when you have a, a group of actors that you write for, that you have different, I, I've had different ideas for plays that uh, I had written at various times and also I'd be sitting in a room, or I know we do this thing called the summer intensive where we go away for a couple weeks um, upstate and everyone just gets around and, 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 and starts working on new material, doing readings. And a lot of times I'll sit there and I'll be like, I'll know that these four actors that I really love are gonna be up there. And I'm like, oh, you know, this one idea that I've had Maybe with these four actors, this is like the right time to do it. And then I would just write a play, given oh, the people that I knew that were gonna be up there. And then the, the, the dynamic, the creative dynamic there is everyone's kind of, it's sort of a family and everyone knows each other very well, so it's very aggressive kind of 
uh, environment where people are not afraid to say, you know, this sucks, and uh, why, you know, why, why are you doing this here, or you know, why don't you do it this way? And it's a very a lot of like arguing and fighting and, and support and love. But it's, it's you know, I, I think in, in those kind of communities where you have a certain intimacy, it's very helpful to have people that are very uh, tough on you because it's always that. I'm sure everyone that's already knows that lying to walk up having the confidence to do it and not sort of collapse in on yourself, but still be able to be self-critical and be able to take criticism. So it's generally not, I mean, when I give people plays and feedback, I don't, it's, as much as it's nice that people say, oh, this was great, that was great, I really want to hear about what didn't work, what they think like sucks, what the problems are. It's in, I feel like in an honest community where people really like hammer you, I think that's the um, best way to create work. And uh, it's a labyrinth that's kind of something that happens where, by the way, most people wouldn't say that a labyrinth, they don't know how loving, you know, how loving and supportive it all is. And that was kind of the thing. And then I think recently, someone was um, actor Phil Hoffman, who ran the company for a while, everyone was talking about how loving and supportive it was. And he said, if I were a writer, I would never show any of you my work. <laughs> because it's like, actually, you all were like, um, Vicious, <laughs> vicious, and, and uh, whatever. So, so I find that environment actually um, a great one to work in, of, of, of knowing that you're going to get um, people that you trust, but that they're going to be aggressive with you. I think that's really, I find that very helpful. Sherry? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I'm in, I'm in two writers groups, and I'm sort of trying to start a third. <laughs> and I think for me, it's, uh, you know, I mean, we could, we could talk about all the different play development programs. We could talk about the O'Neill and Sundance and the Lark and the Lab. And I mean, you guys can Google all those. I mean, what I what I start getting frustrated with is that you know you apply for those programs and then you wait you know nine months to a year to find out if you get in. And so you're you're back in the same position as you were if you had the finished play and you're waiting for someone to accept you and take you. And then and then when you're there, um, you, you know the the stakes can be so high in those places mm -hmm. that uh, I, you know, there, there's just sort of a, a, I think a stage fright and a terror that kind of sets in because you, you know, you, you don't want it to be that rough play that you're developing. You want it to be a finished product that impresses all those other starry playwrights that you're with and whatever. So, um, so I, but, but it's mostly like the waiting that that I got tired of and the waiting to be accepted and rejected in order to write my play, in order to work mm -hmm. on my play. So, um, so, uh, you know, I, uh, with. I'm in one writers group that started, you know, about gosh, I think like 10, 15 years ago. A bunch of people that graduated from the same playwriting program started it, and every couple of years, if people move away, they bring new people in. So I was lucky to be brought into that and meet twice a month and and share work with each other. Um, it's, you know, there's no organization that supports us. It's just, you know, a group of people. And then I'm in an, another group that started with, again, some more things, just a bunch of friends all sharing work together. And little by little, people's schedules changed and it got so hard to, to schedule. Like no one had the same free time, or if we did, no one had a play ready. So um, one of the people in the group, um, who's one of my best friends, and he's a Miami born, bred Kenny Finkel, who uh, a lot of people here have worked with. Um, he he uh, has participated in the, my, the playwrights development program. Yes. Itself, so yes. Anyone in Miami needs to know about this. You can I'll, I'm, I'm going to talk yeah. about that. Um, but but anyway, long story short, like he and I now just meet alone. Like we started, meet, we were actually meeting like once a week. Sometimes we meet um, less frequently than that. But the thing is, is that he's uh, he's my my best best friend in the world, and there's nothing that I would share with him. So you know, you, you want those people that are going to be like ruthlessly honest with you. Um, and he, and he is, but in a way that like you know your best friend can be like ruthlessly honest with you. And, and so. Um, there's sort of no, uh, nothing that's sort of too rough, that I, it, there's, there's no polishing, it's just, you know, help me, what do you think, what do you think, and so, I mean, that's to say that, you know, A, you know, don't wait to be accepted into a group, just start your own group, and then, you know, it doesn't matter um, the size of it, if it's just you and your close friend, like, so be it, and um, I think the other thing I would add is that it doesn't have to be playwrights, you know, if, if, if you're friends with a, a director or designer, you know, the, are actors. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be just a group of writers. Because I know, I mean, we're privileged in that we live in New York, and you know, every waiter and hairdresser is a playwright too. So you know, <laughs> you can gather a group of eight people to replay is like that. But if you're in a community where it's not lousy with playwrights, then um, you know, bring in you know, novelists or you know, anyone, a painter. I mean, everyone is going to have some perspective and some insight in their work. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So don't wait. Don't don't send your script in and wait months just to be part of the group. Les? Yeah, I think I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, I'm a teacher. I teach playwriting at Columbia. And one of the things that I feel in the classroom is how to talk to each other so that playwrights still stay open. Because I've been in the position of losing my play. Um, I've been in the position of getting too much feedback, or getting feedback I couldn't choose from, or getting feedback I couldn't defend myself against, and ultimately losing that ethereal thing that informs you while you're writing. It's sort of that peripheral intelligence that you have that is sort of over here and not necessarily there. And so I felt a little careful and a little protective of my students. And one of the things that we do is we learn how to give feedback, or we try to learn how. It's a week-to-week -week thing. And, and I find a lot of times what's most helpful is to put feedback in terms of questions. So that when, when I ask for feedback, or when I'm in a group with other writers, whoever they are, I, that's that's an approach. I don't like it when people make suggestions about my play. I don't want to be told how it ends. I like to know what you think the story is. I'm not miss. Don't tell me. Don't give me adjectives about my characters because I really can fall off that sensitive place of what it takes to write something. So I've had the experience of. You know, I had a play of mine taken to be done at ACT in San Francisco, my second play, and I didn't start writing until I was 45. So I, I, when I moved into it, I moved into it because I just wanted to be with my kids. So I moved away from, from acting, and I moved into writing because I thought that would allow us to hang out together. <laughs> and it did. So <laughs> that was a good choice. So, <laughs> but so my second play when it started out at this big theater, you know, a thousand feet seat theater, and I didn't quite have the ending in place, and suddenly I was there with a very verbal director and a very verbal main person, and I could not end that play. I could not find the end of it, and it was my second one. My first one created some noise. Everyone was looking for my second one, and it failed. So the sensitivity of what it is to hold on to something while it's still in that vibrating form is something that you learn. And I thought maybe I would just share with you it, it, what's happening for me right now, which is that I feel like I started a play I didn't expect to write. It just came to me in one of my writing groups, which I do. I do women's writing groups every Wednesday. And I, um, this play just showed up for me, and it ended up being in a psych ward. And it, it really is about insanity. And it was making me feel insane. <laughs> and I thought that was a good thing. <laughs> but it scared me, and I didn't know if it was my right guide. I didn't know if I would lose this play. So I went to somebody I respect, a, a woman who works as a dramaturg. She worked at, as a, the lit manager at the Manhattan Theater Club for nine years. She was there when I was there. And um, I asked her if she would flank me while I wrote this play. I just took her to lunch, and I said, I don't know what's going to be in this for you. I'm not going to pay you. <laughs> I'll take you to lunch. I'm going to be needy. <laughs> now, I'm going to call you when you don't want me to. I can't imagine what's in it for you. <laughs> but the play is making me vibrate, so will you help me? Do you like me enough? <laughs> And she said, I'll read the play. And I said, how long is it going to take for you? <laughs> you know, I had to show her right away who I was. I'm going to be here, and I'm going to be needy until you write back. She said, a week. A week. So I'm just sitting there a week later on that day. And she called me up, and she asked me one question, which I now don't even remember what it was. Um, and, but it was a good question. It made me think. It made me want her even more. So I said to her, are you going to do this? Before I, before I even answer this question, are you going to do it? She said, I am. And I said, why? And she said, because your play gives me goosebumps. Mm -hmm. That was the whole reason. And she has been by my side for the last six months. She has arranged readings for me at the Lark. 
She has arranged readings for me to just be in rooms with nobody else except for five crazy actors and me. And the experience of this play is entirely different than any other one I've done because it, it scares me. And I am so glad I finally have a play that scares me. So that, that's, that's it. <laughs> oh, I also want to say, Tina, I'm so impressed that you even wear white. <laughs> because those of us who wear black don't notice when people spill white. <laughs> I need to wear black or white. white. Oh, do you? Well, white is just another version of black. Oh, wonderful. I'll think of it that way. <laughs> spill out poetry. All the time. <laughs> I want to ask what frightened you, what scared you, what part of it? It's too close to something insane in me. It's too close to the insanity of my family. It's just, it, it's, it's lifted. It's, it's, not, it's not a photograph of life. It is definitely not a photograph. But it does make me shake. It makes me shake to even talk about it. Because it's, um, it's vicious. I've never written anything vicious. Well, now that you have, is it out? It's, it's in my purse. <laughs> I don't leave it alone much. <laughs> <laughs> it's my ankles. <laughs> I, I think what's great what you're talking about is it. I mean, it's a development, so it's your development, and it can be any way that you want it. And I think it took me a while as a young writer to realize that everyone else's process was didn't have to be mine. Yeah. And so there's a. I remember one reading at Marin Theater, which is a wonderful theater. And that Steve Effie has worked out, we both worked out a bunch. But they had this whole new process, which I'd never heard of, where that we were there for two weeks, and they would do a reading after one week and a reading after two. And, but you could arrange them as you wanted. They're like, we can do two in the middle, and then you don't have to read it and keep working for the rest of the week at the end. You can do one at the very beginning, like you walk in, there's people, you hear it, and then you work for two weeks and have one. You can just, you can rearrange it, and the idea of it being that flexible. And at the O'Neill as well, there's like, what kind of designer do you want to work with? Do you, do, or do you want anyone at all? Do you want this just a staged reading? Do you want it in kind of up and alive and with sound? And so I mean, the idea of what, what helps you, and I think it, at, as a playwright, it can help you arrange your thoughts about your own play so it, it still helps you write and know your work to go is this a play where I want a designer in the room why because there's something in the play that needs design that needs that language um, well what does that tell me about what this play is so and timing wise are you a person that is not going to be served by a short rehearsal and then 50 strangers listening to your play or is that going to freak you out to the point where you're like I can't fix everything I want to fix I'm, I'm checking out myself. <laughs> or is this like a weak thing? Or I mean, how, how do you want to do with it? Who you work with? As you say, like finding this great friend. Yeah. So Steve is my, is like your best friend. He's the one that I trust with everything. Um, and so it's it, it, that relationship is is like so valuable because I don't have to be perfect. And he knows the things that I always do. And he's like, you're doing that thing with your female characters again, Lauren. Like, oh, <laughs> you know that. Um, so anyway, but I, I, I think taking charge of it, it, it also releases that um, somewhat unhelpful gratitude, that posture of like, whenever you're ready, I'm here with my awesome play, please accept me, and more like, I'm ready to work on this. This is my story, and you can lean forward, and if you read Jail Challenge book, lean in to your play or your career. Um, <laughs> and, to, and, to, and to be your own like diagnostician, is that how you say that word? Mm -hmm. You know, and like you know, she, you know, she figured out exactly what she needed and, and how to get that help. And so I think, um, you know, like she said, you know, maybe I need a designer in the room. Maybe you know, uh, you know, I've written plays where characters are almost silent, and you have a reading, and, and everyone's like, well, you know, what's that guy doing? And but on, on stage, you would really see what that guy's doing. So you know, to, to sort of look really shrewdly and closely at your own play, and, and even. With my friend, you know, sometimes we're like, you know, we just, you know, I, 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 we just need like two months to kind of generate more material before we meet, and um, you know, to to so, I th and I think a lot of it just comes with practice of sort of doing things that don't help you to realize what does help you. Um, so it's sort of you know trying to figure that out for yourself, and then like asking for it. I think when you, even when you are involved in a play development program. I mean, they genuinely do want to help you. So if you say, you know, the, the way that this is scheduled actually isn't helping me right now. And to be able to articulate, um, you know, what you think a, a, a significant change would be, if that helps. David, I want to ask you, in, at, at Labyrinth, is there a time when everybody basically agrees the play is done? 
Um, there's a time where about 10% agree it's done and 90% think it sucks. It's usually how it you know, works in any large collective. Uh -huh. I mean, it's like a large group of people, and it's, 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 a, it's um, I, I, I compare the company to the guy it's like democracy in India. Or something, it's like there are about, you know, Labyrinth started out as a Latino um, theater company, um, essentially for, it, it was off of, I think, when um, Mike Nichols did um, Death in the Ma Death in Maiden, or something mm -hmm. but he did that, he said, he notoriously said, he cast a bunch of white celebrities as Latinos, and he notoriously said something like, I couldn't find anyone to cast. And everyone's like, all the Latin right. actors were like, really? And so Latin <laughs> came out of, here we yeah. are, these Latin yeah. actors. Great. And so since then, it's um, gathered more, um, uh, you know, diverse, uh, gathered more diversity. But so there's no, in a, in a way, there's, there, there's so many different people, but there's so many people with so many different tastes uh -huh. that, that um, there's very few people that ever think something's done. And it, I mean, I, but I don't even know how many writers ever kind of, you know, it's that quote that I've heard attributed to a million people, but it's sort of like about like novels saying, you know, you just, whatever you've never done, you walk away, or, or mm -hmm. you know, whatever that that is. So, so I don't know, I, I rarely feel like something's done. Also kind of what Leslie was saying a little bit is that there's always gonna be someone, you can think someone's, something's done, and there's always gonna be someone's gonna be like, you know that ending, you know, everyone wants to, to do to your play what they would do if they wrote That's the play. Right. And so, it'd be like, that ending, I really like your ending, but what if this, or that character, I wanted to see this. I mean, so you're always, you're never gonna get a real sense of completion. I think so that's, I don't think that's an aspect of playwriting, is feeling like, you know, that you just sort of chiseled something and it's right. complete and now. Um, but, but I, I do wanna talk about what, what Leslie was saying about, you know, I thought was great about when you find something that you're writing that is, that, um, Goosebumps or fear, the fear, because mm -hmm. to me that's the most that is sort of the heart yes. of playwriting, yes. and because I have zero interest in plays that I see where I feel like this play writer was never afraid of anything, this writer's never put themselves out on the line. And mm -hmm. recently, I saw some relatively successful play in New York, and a friend of mine commented on it, and it was it was a good, solid, well written play. And, and um, the friend I saw it with said it was like television for smart people. I, I know the play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, well, the, the, there's a lot. There's a lot of them, and it, and it feels like people that so people that yes. What? Which one? What? Um, that wasn't the one, but yes, I think that's why. But we think that too. I mean, I think, uh, uh, could be any yeah, could be, I mean, that's. I mean, but that's a yeah. sad state. I think of a lot of commercial theater yeah. right now, where there's no danger, and so for me. Uh, for writers finding their voice for the stuff that I find interesting in theater is when you're writing something and you think this is the thing that I'm going to be really humiliated about when I have to hear actors read it aloud or uh, that you're just afraid of. I mean, to me, that's where you need to go. Anytime that you feel that, the goosebumps, the fear, the um, uh, being revealed, that that to me is the heart, yeah. the heart of it, as opposed to that it's not an intellectual pursuit. It's not like writing an essay, figuring something out logically, going, oh, now I know the third act because right. this, this, and that makes sense, that it has nothing to do with that. What you were talking about was, I, I can't remember the term you used, but I heard, like, to me, the unconscious, this, incident, this incidental thing, allowing the unconscious, the things that aren't the kind of things that you plan when you sit down and you talk about what your characters are and you think about what your climax is at the end of this moment or whatever. The rational, I think, a lot of times can be your enemy in playwriting. And so finding a way to free the unconscious and the dangerous elements of what you're capable of, to me, is really the most important thing to figure out as a writer. And, and I think part of that is, is when you're having that experience of actually embracing what it is that's frightening to you, I think that the, the part of the reason I felt that I wanted to do this with a friend was the, the, the ability to tolerate that. Not only tolerate it in yourself, but tolerate what people will tell you about it. Because people like to be technical about plays. If you do this here, you have to tie it up three quarters of the way through the play. And if you don't do, and so my fear was that I've done that with my plays. The play that was out in the ACT, I made too neat. It started out as a kind of complicated, messy play. And that's where its life was. And when I made it make sense, it just died. It's like a souffle that just died. So when you know that you can do that, when you know, when you have the experience of knowing that you didn't make the right choices with your own play, you just have to continue to learn about what is right for you, how do you value yourself. And just let me say in terms of ending things, one of the things that I find important and, and helpful in my life is, is looking at how artists, painters work. 
not just how playwrights work, but how painters work. Because the process of creating something visual is amazingly helpful in terms of what is process in general. And so I've taken a number of, of classes at the New School on, on painters. And one of the things that I like in terms of what you said about nothing being finished is Degas. One of the wild things about Degas, who was cuckoo, but, but what he really did was when he what would sell his paintings to his patrons, and then he would go to his house, to their house for dinner, he brought his paints, and he would get up from the dinner table and keep working on what was on the wall. That impulse of when something is finished is something I think you always struggle with. How is it, when are you content with it? Do you want to go back to it? Those kinds of questions are a great thing to just keep asking yourself. At some point, you do have to decide this is done now. Mm -hmm. But that interest in keep working is something to be aware of. I'd like to open it up because I, I have a feeling that this, that people have conversations that they want to that they want to have. I, I, am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, Dylan. Um, uh, yeah, this sort of ties into the And thing. speak up so everybody uh, back there can hear you. All right. Um, when you are uh, doing a reading of any of your plays with other actors, not for an audience, but in a writer's group or something like that, do you find yourself giving notes to the actors during the reading, or do you step back and sort of just let them do their thing? And what's your process of tolerance to that? Because you, you were talking about how the, the play that you're writing now is really personal. So do you have a hard time not saying, like, oh, no, that character is... So more along the lines of this than the way you're doing it right now. <laughs> or do you let the play be interpreted? You mean for, for a reading? Or for reading. For reading? Yeah. Uh, you know what? It, it's sort of a, it, it's so hard for me to make like a general response. Everything is different according to where you are in the process, who the reading is for. <laughs> You know, we've done a lot of readings just around the table, and I'm asking the actors to come in cold and just come off their instincts. I, I just want to know, what is your instinct with this character? And I pay attention to when they seem to fall off it. You also go to the cat actors that you think are going to inhabit this kind of easily. You, you know, even if it's wrong in places, you can still hear it somewhat. So in, I, I think there's value to cold readings. I've experienced them both as an actor as as a writer. I think over-rehearsed readings, you can lose it. I think you can read it through, and then you read it through again, and they've lost what they had to begin with. I think there's something fresh to allowing actors to just be Olympic about it. Ski the slope. Throw it at them and let them ski the slope. And if it's wrong, and it will be sometimes. It will. I had a reading at the Manhattan Theater Club last year that was so terrible. It was so terrible. That it was, I just, it took, and when we walked out, the artistic director said to me, so what did you learn from that? And I said, I learned I cannot vomit in the middle of things. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not a small thing to learn. But if it's, if it's not a public reading, if it's just you, and I, I, would, I would say, I would ask to, uh, one of my writer's groups, I remember, a character had guy who was a farmer and for some reason one of the writers was reading was reading with this like very very thick like southern accent and she was just like whoa 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 he's from Berkeley California like he's not southern and, you know it was, it was as simple as that you know if you feel like you're actually not hearing your play it's not helping you it's not that an actor I find if they've they've started an interpretation that's wrong eventually they're gonna like fall off the play like the play won't be there to support that interpretation and they're gonna get stressed and self-conscious and upset, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I think it's fine to make a small adjustment and say, you know, he's not really angry right now, and you can say it very, very sort of moderately and mildly and just throw a little, you know. But it does yeah. help you realize what's not on the page. Yeah. Is yeah. there a stage direction, is there a note at the beginning to go? I mean, my work, yeah. I, I have to specify, commas mean this, a pause means mm -hmm. this versus a beat. My work, like, mm -hmm. go fast until the pause. And that doesn't mean go fast through the line, but just pick up your cues, or else it's not going to be funny, or it's not going to be this, or it's not going to be clear. And that stuff I think actors will find helpful because it's, it's technical. But be better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is not helping yeah. you. Like, I don't know why you would proceed. You know? It's fine. Yeah. I mean, acting's hard, so be nice to them. Back there? Um, can I'll just stand up. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I can see you all. Can you speak to finding like the right group? Because I know I've been in some of the wrong groups a couple times. Like when I first moved down here, lovely people. I still talk with them. They're great people, but they weren't the right people for me to chat mash with. We were writing totally different styles. And how do you say no, I guess? Or how do you find the right group? And if you found the wrong group, how do you say, eh, bye, <laughs> politely in that group bridges? <laughs> um, I'll, I, if you, I think if, if you find, I mean, life's short. You know, if you've got, if, get, you know, it's not like, you know, thanks. You know, it's pretty, pretty. I mean, easy to be like, just not do it again. You know, I think <laughs> the, the, find the people that inspire you, <coughs> that, that push you, and if it's not, just um, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and if there was like maybe one person in that group that you did like. You know, have coffee without food. <laughs> right. But I think you have to, you know, find them and bring them together yourself. There's nothing wrong with being protective of your work. Mm -hmm. And when you're protective of something, you can be your stronger self. Mm -hmm. You can be your blunter self. Mm -hmm. And and that will serve you. You don't have to be the, the, one of the hardest lessons that I find is with my drawing up for that. One of the, is, is learning how to um, get what you need and not worry about being nice. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, Leslie, this is kind of directed to you because you mentioned when you had to play at ACT, they confined you and they made you fall in all these places. It was better as a sloppy mess. And I think in my writer's group, I'm kind of the rogue playwright, they have all these, the 15 rules. The antagonist has to be introduced by this page and the arc has to be here. Thank leave, you. So leave that then. group. Yeah. Okay, I agree. No, I I leave that group. I'm like, gosh, and, and they say, that's why you're not published. That's why you're not getting this. I'm like, God, I just, I just feel like I'm losing myself and my my vision and my voice when I fall into your little save the cat book that you guys go by and these rules. I just feel like I'm breaking all the rules, and then I think, well, maybe I'm sabotaging my potential career, but I'm just so funny. And um, my pa my pages are so much funnier when I just kind of let it go pouring out of me, and then I just kind of fine tune it, and I don't follow any rules. So you agree that a sloppy mess? Well, you know, I'm I'm <laughs> like I'm too sudden and I'm extreme, and I'm probably okay. not the person to answer this question. But <laughs> I think I'm most like you. I, I think you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that basically you just said what you need. Say. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter okay. what any of us say. I think that you just said what you needed to say. If something in you, and I think this is true too, that you know when you're feeling hemmed in, and when you're yeah. feeling hemmed in, you can't access right. the best part of you. So then, but then it, it seems like you trouble. just answered the question. Yeah, but it's like Amy from Sam French going to see it and say, oh, she's not hitting this, or it's not the. I mean, <coughs> where do you kind of? Say okay, I submit. I I agree. I need to do it your way to get it published. Or when do you say nope? This is the way I want it. This is the way it's going to end. I respect what you're saying, but I just I'm. I mean, you, kind I of I wonder if there you could read plays of playwrights that are published that are wild and crazy because there are a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just see what they look like on the page. Okay. Because, because actually, yeah. As, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, and there's no magic rule. <coughs> just because you do that doesn't mean that you go right, right to. You know, right. Broadway. Can I tell you about one of my, one of our first uh, MFAs at, at Hunter College, Jonna Adams, who wrote um, a whole trilogy about a group of people in Texas who raised um, rattlesnakes. And she writes very <laughs> strange, haunted, disturbing. very disturbing plays. And she and the fir and the other three MFAs um, in the first semester went away on a retreat over Martin Luther King weekend to inspire each other and challenge each other. And they'd sit in a circle and they'd go, okay, 10 minutes, you have to come back to the circle with 10 ideas for a new play. And they'd mm -hmm. go around in the circle. And during this time, uh, Jonna came up with a group of ideas. And one of them was, I'd like to write a play about um, a parent of a five-year-old, of a, of a five, fifth grader having a conference with the teacher. And something terrible happens. And in the course of the play, the, the, the child commits suicide, and the teacher, and then the parent goes to confront the teacher to see what did the teacher do? Why did the teacher um, um, suspend the child that ended up in the child committing suicide? And she wrote this very, very dark two-hander in class. Very dark. 
and I'm a mommy, and I and, and it was red, and everyone was sort of <gasps> goosebumps. I mean, this was bleeding from the eyes by the time it was over. And when everybody left, I just said, "Listen, John, I'm a mother, and I don't know, just this thing that happens. I just have to tell you, I find that really hard to take, and I think the audience is going to find it hard to take." Jonna, God bless her. Well, Tina, that's very interesting, but I'm going to be seeing my writer's group on Sunday. <laughs> They'll tell me what they have to think about it. So I appreciate your comments. OK, long story short, this December, um, American Theatre Magazine published her play. In American Theatre, a complete unknown who wrote this very strange, haunted play picked it out of all of the slots, you know, ignored all of the comers and all of the people who were having wonderful successes all over the place for Jonna with her sick brain <laughs> that now is having 12 productions across the wow. country. So let me just say one more final thing, is that when I begin my playwriting class with my new students, the first thing I have them read is a huge chapter from Jung's autobiography, Dreams, Memories, Reflections, in which he talks as a young boy of 10, of feeling very ill at ease with the world and not really belonging to the world. And when he sits on a stone in the garden, is he sitting on the stone or is the stone being sat upon, wondering about what is it like to be sat upon? <coughs> and his father was, Jung's father was a minister and, and, and things were very austere at the house and the mother was always sick. And Jung, as a little boy, felt that he was both a young man and an old man, and he really didn't have anyone to talk to. And so to console himself, he bought a little pencil box, box with a ruler inside, and he took the ruler, and he carved out of the ruler a little man, a little homunculus, a little figure. And he carved this little figure out, and he dressed him in a little black frock and a little coat, and he, and he would write little messages for him, and he'd make a little library for him, and he'd put him in the pencil box, and he'd go up to the attic and he'd hide the little homunculus in the pencil box in the attic. And whenever he was in despair, he would tiptoe up to the attic and he would open the pencil box and he would look at the little man and write him more little, more little lectures and more little poems. And he took enormous comfort from this. And he had no idea what any of it meant. And it turned out years and years and years later that there is a template for this in African societies of people worshiping tiny little gods and, and you know, endowing them with all sorts of, of powers and so forth and so on. But the point of the story is that Jung felt ang anxiety and mystery and confusion and the goosebumps that you were talking about. And he wasn't a playwright, he wasn't a writer, but he acted on that and he made, and his creative act was creating this little tiny figure. To me that is the same thing as us you know, stewing about a play that we have or ideas that we have. And so we write our little play and we and it's our secret and we put it in the pencil box and we go up and we commune with it. And and what I say to the students all the time is that look, you have something inside of you that nobody else has and the whole point of being a playwright is to explore that and to share it with other people. That you put on the stage what you've never seen before and which only you understand. And it can be weird and it can be funny and it can be outrageous. But it's got to start with that impulse of trying to understand and trying to entertain and trying to console so that you know you go back to that little man in the pencil box and that imagine being 10 years old and creating a little alternate ego. But it's the same that it could have been a play. So as much as we need writers groups and or MFA programs and or people standing around us applauding, I think it's basically about going back, to answer your question, going back into your own strange, exalted, mysterious, dappled world and pulling out what you have inside of you that is yours and that is special and like Jonna, look at this girl, unknown, <coughs> American <laughs> Theatre Magazine, 12 <coughs> productions. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. With that in mind, I think we, we adjourn for lunch.